Uh, so we just watched Guardians of the Galaxy last night, three. Have you, how many of you have seen that? There's no spoilers. I'm not going to spoil it for you. Fantastic movie. Really enjoyed it. Um, there's a line in there that one of the characters uses that's going to be kind of uh, worked into what we talk about today, and that's it's nice to have friends. Who here, at least, if you didn't see the movie, can just give me an amen that it's nice to have friends. It's nice to have friends. It's really nice to have friends. I think Jesus spent a lot of time showing us that, that that is true as well. And on that note, let's take a look at a couple of passages from the New Testament. We're going to start in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 19, 24. I'm gonna, oh, I better leave it on. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I've talked about this before. It's important to me. And um, that word for money there typically is mammon, which is bigger than money. It's the economies of our world. It's the stuff that makes our world go round. The big things that you don't even think about, that you accept and that you participate in, and that we all participate in here because we're here, and it's a big experiment. But we sometimes can take for granted what that means, and I find it interesting that Jesus chooses to use the words, he'll he'll either be devoted to the one and despise the other. He'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So this morning, first I'd like to look at, well, let's hop back up a couple verses and look at what does it look like to lay up treasures on earth? I think there's obvious stuff. Um, The material stuff that's easy to see, like money and our possessions. I think it's interesting that we call them possessions, but we don't have time to get into that. It's an interesting choice of words. What about the immaterial things? The things that we devote ourselves to, our passions, people, politics, political figures, ideals, governments, organizations, those are all part of the world economy, and those are all things that we can devote ourselves to. All the things that fuel the economy of the world, whatever the flavor of the economy of the world, capitalism, communism, socialism, totalitarianism, other isms that I'm missing. What's it look like to store up treasure in heaven is what I wondered when I read this. And I think we have a misguided traditional view of what this means. Like it's some sort of warped score system that Peter Hyatt has made fun of in the past, helping us to calculate our score and see how well we're doing on amassing our heavenly treasures. Um, I tend to view it as literally true that Jesus was serious when he said repeatedly that the kingdom of God is at hand, that you can lay up treasures in heaven today and tomorrow. Can't do it yesterday. Um, Peter has created this nice image to help us with this paradigm shift that is required to see it this way, that we are living in the sixth day of creation, still being created in the image, yet the cross has happened and has evaded all time. And our linear space-time just kind of cruises through the middle of that. Not, it's not visible to us, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. Well, in regard to storing treasure in heaven, I think Jesus was speaking to this when he assured people repeatedly that all of the law and prophets hang on two commandments. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, he says. And a second is like that one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words... You shall be devoted to God and in turn to your neighbor. I talked 
a while back about our neighbor being whoever's around us, and I still hold to that as a reality for us. The person in front of you is your neighbor when you're there, right? It's not the person that lives next to you in the house next to you only. That's not your only neighbor. That is your neighbor when you're at home in your house. So I want to talk about shadow a little bit. Light and darkness combine to make shadow. Shadow is not black and white, but it's gray. A shadow is created as light is blocked by something. It's so rare for us to see it on the moon that we all gather. We travel across the country to get to the specific point where you can get the best photograph of this event when it happens. It's so rare, a full eclipse. This is a photo uh, that Heather's brother took. He's a photographer in Columbus, Ohio. The guy is magical. He makes Columbus, Ohio look like a place I want to go. Like, it is really magical. He, his work is amazing. He took this in, uh, in Tennessee, wherever the, the best point was determined to be, Sparta, Tennessee. I remember uh, recently we had not a full eclipse, but a partial eclipse, and I was working, tearing down um, one of Bailey's sets from a play that she was in. It was late at night. We were all working hard to move all these heavy set pieces. We looked up and saw the moon turning red, and I remember everybody stopping what we were doing. We all stopped to gather together and just watch the event as it, as it passed. And that shadow is so rare to see on the moon that it gets our attention. It's really common on earth. The moon is a reflection of the light from the sun, and I think the sun was a reflection of the light from the Father. He repeatedly reminded us, if you see me, you see him. We live in a shadow world, literally surrounded by shadows endlessly. I don't believe that we're ever, probably pretty rare if so, ever in total darkness or total light on earth. We're always in a mix of the two for the most part. Have you ever been trying to read and had someone walk in and stand in your light? Maybe younger eyes, not so much an issue, but uh, all of a sudden you can't read, right? It's irritating. Hey, can you move out of the light? I'm trying to read. Um, But shadows are a part of our every moment on earth. You can't detach from your shadow. You cannot run away from it. We all tried as kids. We never succeeded. That thing always, unless you went into a darker place, right? Then you could get rid of it. Thomas Merton once said, a life devoted to shadow is a life of sin. I do want to dig into that a little bit this morning. This doesn't mean that life isn't still spent in shadows. What it's, what it's talking about, that quote, is the devotion that matters. It's the drive that matters. It's the focus, the dedication that matters. So many times in years past and with friends, I've preached or told people that being a Christian is about seeing past someone else's junk, right? In order to see the beauty in them or see the light inside them. Well, this morning I want to flip that narrative Let's try to think about it as really it's about seeing past my junk to see the beauty in Lynn and Bill and Tom and Josh, Peter. It's not about them. It's about me, not in a bad way. (laughs) It's my heart condition. This is another paradigm shift that we're in desperate need of understanding, I feel. I'm in control of exactly one person in this world. You are in control of exactly one person in this world. Parents included. We are guides for our children, but we are not in control of them. Just let one grow up. You will find out quickly if you don't find out when they're little. I'm just saying perhaps it's better for us to focus on the dam that's stopping up the light in you, in us, and casts a shadow over them. Maybe our time is better spent on the shadow that we're casting. In a sense, we're standing between God and others, casting a shadow, a patch of diminished light upon them in the world. But we're busy, right? We've got to conduct transactions, got to get to the next transaction. We've got to keep the economy of the world running. Well, I want to talk a little bit about devotion. 
since I think it's key to that Merton quote, that devotion to shadow is a life of sin. When I looked up devotion in the dictionary, the first word used to describe it is love. And then it's followed by loyalty or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. I looked up the spies. That's pretty strong. You don't really need to look it up, but I wondered what would come up. And it, it says to feel contempt or a deep repugnance for. Devotion to the things of this world, we're told in Scripture, creates enmity with God. Enmity, the state of feeling or being actively opposed or hostile to something or someone. It's what happens to our heart. It's a widely undiagnosed heart condition. Getting rid of all your possessions, well, it won't cure it. Your mind can still be possessed, alone and possessionless, but still possessed. Scripture is clear, I feel, that we can't serve two masters, we, but we do seem to have two masters vying for our devotion. Peter's talked about them endlessly through Romans every week, I think, Jesus and Mises. Our devotion is constantly decided. It's, it's, not, a one, it's not a camp thing, as Peter said a couple weeks ago. It, it is not a one-time event at camp. It is constantly decided. Your devotion, day by day, minute by minute, second by second, is decided. While I was back from my grandfather's funeral, my, my grandmother, I found out, and he were married for 73 years. They were together for 78 and, you know, I hear people ask folks all the time in, in videos, you, wherever, social media, what's the secret? What's the secret to a 43-year marriage? Well, it's no secret. It's devotion. And a lot of times, it looks like choosing someone else over yourself. It's not pretty, really. It's, it's, uh, it's hard. But it is pretty at the same, it is beautiful, it's just not pretty. And that is part of what loving your neighbor as yourself looks like, I think. In Luke 16, there's a difficult passage that I love, quite frankly. So we're going to read this parable in Luke 16. He, Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a main uh, manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this uh, that I hear about you? Turning in the account, turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the, rich, to the true riches. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I personally love this parable. Anyone know why? It's because nobody knows what to do with it. It can't be easily explained away. It doesn't fit the narrative. But body of Christ, we, you, can't be explained away. 
And I don't believe we're called to live in a way that fits the narrative. Any of the narratives that try to absorb it. But specifically, the narrative that the systems of this world are more important than the person who's standing right in front of you right now. Notice that it follows, oh, well, you would notice if you had a Bible open, that it follows the parable of the prodigal son, a parable that I think is a great picture of devotion. I think in that, in that parable, devoted to is the same, the picture of devoted to is the embrace of that father when his long lost son returns, the reckless abandon of the father running scandalously to embrace him. Peter talked about this parable recently. And I want to look quickly at devotion in, in that parable of the prodigal son. The oldest son seems to be devoted to the property, the honor, the tradition, the possessions, the things of this world, unable to share in the joy of the return of his younger brother. The younger brother was also lost for a while in devote, and devoted to passions and desires. Both brothers are guilty of pride and arrogance in that regard. One was obvious because he flaunted it, reveled in it, and one was less obvious because he hid it in his heart. Well, back to the parable of the dishonest manager. We're not going to unpack this parable this morning, but I believe the key to understanding lies in verses 8 and 9. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. This parable is filled with and takes place in the shadows. It's honest. I had a couple of observations. Unrighteous wealth. Is there any wealth that's righteous? Maybe. Our economy versus God's economy that's a tough, that's a long, that's a philosophical discussion. I'll leave that to the philosophers. Make friends for yourselves. Seems pretty clear. Don't think that needs much unpacking, right? And eternal dwellings, your friends will greet you. Seems like the treasure might be relational, even in heaven, in the eternal dwellings. Well, commentators are all over the board on this parable. There's a burning desire that's obvious to defend God and to defend goodness and defend what's right. To me, that looks a lot like more of the same self-consumption that's prevalent today. The self-justification that allows us to so easily not excuse others, to not forgive others. Our addiction to being right is very strong, but it's not as strong as our inability to see it in ourselves. Self-justification is, is at epidemic levels. The social media trend to ban toxic people from your life, just shut them out if they don't agree with you, is alarming. I understand sometimes there's a real need to do this. I'm looking right now at Jolene. I understand that a trained professional counselor could counsel you to do this, but I think it's gone a little beyond that at this point seems to be if you don't eat the same bread that I do, then you're out of my life. That's it. You're toxic. You eat wonder bread. Can't even believe it. The older brother in the parable of the prodigal son is held or stuck in the shadow of contempt, pride, and arrogance. The commentators on the parable of the dishonest manager seem mostly held or stuck in the same shadow of contempt, pride, and arrogance. In James 4, 6, we're told, God gives grace to the humble but resists the proud. Before you start to take delight in targeting the group that you determine to be the proudest today, and don't be fooled that there's not just one, let me share about the word proud that's used here. This word is a Greek word I'm going to butcher, Hooper, Hooper in, the new, in his book, The New Testament Words by William Barclay, he calls this word the word of contempt. Contempt is 
defined in the dictionary as an attitude toward individuals, social groups, and ev uh, eventually ideologies that evokes a sense of superiority and the right to judge amid feelings of disgust and anger. And remember, it was used in the definition of despise. Well, he goes on in his book to describe how that contemptuous heart actually grows and becomes so bad that it rises up against God. Like, I don't know, our atheists of today or our people who have said God doesn't exist and we're going to get angry at him anyway, right? Um, so there's a shift that happens there in the heart and it becomes a rising up against God. In Guardians of the Galaxy 3, there's a moment where the villain is challenged to let something go. He's obsessed with this purpose that he wants done. And his number two says, you're, you're, in, you're going crazy. You've got to let this go. For God's sake, you've got to let it go. And he says, there is no God. That's why I stepped in. That's, that's this word. That's huperaphanous. We like our villains big and easy to spot. Darth Vader, Thanos, Hitler style, you know, big targets. But I fear that we all have the capacity to rise up and take control when we deduce that God is not doing what we need. I know I've been guilty of it. When I look and think, okay, I say it usually. If you're not going to do something, I will. And if you don't like it, then you can undo it. <laughs> As if I'm some threat to God. My desire today is just to help us step outside of what some of what's going on in our lives and to try to see what what we can do to be better people um, if any of you have made the mistake of signing up for next door um, you'll understand this next story saw the story of an accident that happened and it was unfortunate nobody stayed as a witness this happens almost every day on next door um, but you know this this particular person's response was, I'm going to move. I'm going to move to somewhere where there's better people. That's a fallacy. Um, I don't think there's a place where there are better people necessarily. Uh, and quite frankly, as long as you're in this world and you choose to be good, then you can't say that there are no good people where you are. Again, you're responsible for exactly one person. I'm responsible for exactly one person. We need to take lead in a new narrative. We need to take responsibility for our own actions. We need to choose and re-choose to be devoted to God and therefore to our neighbors. If somebody doesn't agree with you, it doesn't automatically mean that they hate you or that they want to harm you. The voices telling you to cut people out of your life who don't agree with you are toxic. So now I'm one. But they're toxic to your soul. Any voice that bans you from making a friend, regardless of their position on things, is dangerous, in my opinion. So how can I love my neighbor as myself? It's easy to say. It has become exceedingly evident that we have no problem with loving ourselves, so we seem to have a handle on that. All we need now to do is apply it to someone else. Forget about the past. It's over. You can't do anything about it. Start now with a little red light, green light action. So I don't do practical application points, but here are a few anyway. You can stop trying to be right, and you can start actively listening to your neighbor. You don't have to agree with someone to love them, period. You can stop justifying yourself, and you can start empathizing with your neighbor. You could stop giving yourself permission to vilify others, and you could start looking for the good in others. You could stop justifying your bad behavior with someone else's worst behavior and calling it good, and start treating others the way you prefer to be treated. Yes even those with whom you disagree. It's okay. It's permissible. You can stop focusing on items that you disagree on and start focusing on the things you agree on. Find commonality. 
Honestly, we just need to recognize when it's time to get down on our knees and pray. Lord, undo me. Put away this flesh and bones until you own this spirit through me. Lord, undo me. There's great power in the concept of you and me. Love your neighbor as yourself is a visual expression of you and me. It's an active expression of that. It's inclusive, it's understanding, it's interpersonal and relational. It's real, it's present, it's an ego killer, and it's the death of self-righteousness. Much like the tupas that Peter talked about in our Romans series, that's what we are. We are much like it because we are it. We are to empty ourselves of ourselves or let ourselves be emptied of ourselves so that we can be filled with the Spirit. There's a friend of ours that was on Chew the Fat. His name is Michael. He was sharing uh, some extreme life trials that he was going through this last week that we met. It's costing him all the treasures of this world, and it's hard. He recognizes that it's God. He recognizes that God is teaching him something about pride in the midst of what he's going through. He's convinced that God is doing it because it's so painful. I mean, he's concerned that God is doing it because it's so painful. And his question to the group was, how can I, how can I live, how can I love myself and hate my life? It was the question that Peter posed last week in the sermon. A lot of times I've found myself there asking God, how much more, God? How much more? And how much longer? Seriously, dude. Seems we might be missing the point, though, that these trials don't seem to be meant to be endured, but rather to be met with loyalty, faithfulness, and fidelity as we are emptied in order to be filled with real life. And that's my encouragement to you today, is just get on your knees and ask to be undone. And let the Lord do what it is that he does so well, fill you with the Spirit so that it can flow out to your neighbor. Amen? So this will be interesting. Got a microphone in my hand, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, oh, it is? Okay. Nice. Thank you. Okay. So, on the night that he was betrayed by his friends, it's nice to have friends, Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat of it and do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after giving thanks, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. We invite all to the table to tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the wine, and ingest the dunamis power of God, the power to transform us in each and every now in which we find ourselves. The brown cups are wine, the blue cups are juice. Both are the blood of Christ poured out for all of you, all of us. This field of dandelions, how many people have eradicated them and said, those are never coming back? <clears throat> but the point is not that you're never going back. The point is, what's your response going to be when you go back? What will your response be? And I hope it's an open heart. I have a few more things that we can try to be better people as, by way of benediction. We could stop trying to manage the light. Stop trying to manage the Holy Spirit. We're not managers of the Holy Spirit. We are vessels of the Holy Spirit. We're not managers of the light 
from heaven, from God. We are, we are vessels of the light. And this is the porthole through which the light comes into our world. We could stop standing in or blocking the light for others. We could start being aware of the person next to us and their need for that light. We could stop seeing a weed when you look at dandelions. We could start seeing flowers. We could pay attention to the shadow that we're casting and repent. How, are, how am I blocking the light? Am I an arbiter of light, a manager of light, a steward of light, or a vessel of light? We're called to take part in a symphony of disagreement in a field of dandelions, weeds. Beautiful. And for that, I say it's nice to have friends. Dandelions agree. I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm not asking you to trust John, who is faithfully slaving over the grill right now for us. I'm not asking for you to trust Peter. I'm not asking for you to put your faith in Joe Biden. I'm not asking for you to put your faith in Donald Trump. I'm not asking for you to trust the Republicans. I'm not asking you to trust the Democrats. I'm not asking you to trust the Libertarians. I'm not asking you to put your faith in CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, Newsmax, Sky News, Daily Wire, anyone else I left out. I'm not asking you to trust Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not asking you to trust Joe Rogan. I'm not asking you to trust Elon Musk. I'm not asking you to trust the US government. I'm not asking you to trust the communist government. I'm not asking you to trust any socialist government. I'm not even asking you to trust the World Health Organization. I'm not asking you to trust the many institutional churches in our world. I'm asking you this morning to trust the Holy Spirit of God, and to be devoted to that spirit. And I know that many of you are, and I know that we fight that battle together all the time. And I'm just encouraging you to continue that battle and to remember the place in your heart that that holds. Please, these things lead to heart conditions, and they're really not as important as, important as they think they are. And I just hope you can see that. By the way, do you know what happens to these things? That's what happens to them. They go to seed, and then they go crazy. And they're really hard to contain. They're hard to stop. So in Jesus' name, be the gospel. Amen.